Some school kids contacted us recently saying, sup, can you CFD our F1 in schools cars? We said, okay. They then said, here's our CAD models. And we said, sweet. True story. So we simulated their three different designs. And I have to say, I am really impressed with them. Like even the general approach is something that I expected from university students nearing completion, not high school kids. I don't actually know how old they are or what school they're from. So you can see I've researched this pretty thoroughly. Anyway, I don't want to show too many details of the geometry because even though they want a video on it, others might copy. So we just have their general setups here being shown. Anyway, they have this list of rules, which are in German, but effectively what these cars are is a block of material with a CO2 canister in the back. Then you put them on a track, hit the pin in the back, and the CO2 being thrown out the back propels the cars forward. Whoever gets the lowest track time wins. The winners get immortalized and the losers get shunned. At least that is my understanding. And I actually did this thing when I was in school. Like I was like 11 or 12 from memory. It wasn't this international F1 in schools thing. We just called them CO2 racers in our class. So I was really surprised to see that they were still a thing. So that's pretty cool. They quickly identified that while the title of the competition is F1 in schools, unlike regular F1 cars, these cars probably didn't need that much downforce because the track is straight and also the cars are tethered by the string going the entire length of the car. Also, I'm not sure if they knew this, but the location of the canister means that the force out of them will be rotating the car downwards into the ground anyway. So you'll get downforce naturally from it. If they did realize that, then I'm again even more impressed because that's something I'd expect from university students, not high schoolers. And this really astute observation of not needing to produce downforce is awesome because producing downforce almost always comes with additional drag. That drag slows the car and produces a slower time. So their underlying philosophy was really just to make it as low drag as possible. We don't see any real wings or anything, but before we even analyze these designs, I want to say right off the bat that from my experience, the key is to make the cars go straight. The more they skew to one side, the less acceleration you get because the CO2 is being thrown at an angle that isn't completely in line with the track. So the force you have isn't being used to throw you completely in the right direction. And also the string under the car now has more friction on it, which also reduces acceleration. And when I did this thing, some fell into that trap and lost because of it. It was such a big deal because it has followed them really everywhere in life since then. In fact, even the current president of Australia only beat his rival in the current election because he had won during school and his rival had lost all those years ago. Now these students wanted to see how aerodynamic each racer was that they had, and then the possible ways to make them more aerodynamic. So to begin with, we'll be seeing each one's aero, and then once we compare them, we'll then see how to improve them and based on the rules. And if you have any suggestions yourself, drop them in the comments below and they can see them. First, we needed to know how fast these things go. So I asked AI and apparently, they get over 60 miles per hour. So like a good pleb, I listen to the AI and I've set the velocity to about 70 miles per hour. To propel forward, the CO2 canisters throw CO2 out the back really fast. I also wanted to model that flow because it can change the wake. Now, one thing to note is that the amount of CO2 coming out and its speed changes with time. That's because as more and more CO2 comes out, the pressure inside the canister drops and that reduces the exit velocity. Then once the canister is empty, obviously, there isn't any CO2 coming out anymore. So what speed should I set the exit velocity of the nozzle? I tried asking AI again, but it said that I was being too needy and I should find the answer myself. Things kind of took a tangent after that. Alas, I couldn't find any reliable numbers, so I estimated a speed of about 80 meters per second. As I said, this velocity will change through the run, so at some point the CO2 should be exiting at around this speed. One more thing to consider is that these cars race on a track. The track has sidewalls that ride up quite high. So I also wanted to see the impact that these sidewalls have on the car's aerodynamics. So we quickly just simulated this first racer with no sidewalls and then with the sidewalls, just to see the difference out of curiosity. Looking at the first racer just on the flat ground, the racer in this plane is really good. It is almost completely streamlined and with only some minor problems with the halo unit at the front and the driver's noggin. The wake is minimal and much of it really comes from the eyelet that the guide string goes through. Comparing that with when the sidewalls are up, interestingly, I think the only major difference is the wake is significantly better, so that's interesting. Looking at the drag orbits, I think the sidewalls make the front wheel wakes much smaller, and I think that's because the flow gets squished in by the wheels more. So we can conclude that the sidewalls make some difference to the aerodynamics, and so we should include them going forward. Let's now look more in depth at the first racer and the sidewalls present. 
Just as a note, I've removed the sidewalls from the view so it's easier to see what's happening around the car. This plane is cutting through the center line of the car and underneath the rear of the car, we get flow acceleration, which again comes with low pressure. So again, I don't think we need to worry too much about downforce because between the canister producing a moment into the ground and the downforce from the underbody, it should be fine. I think the rear edge is perhaps a little sharp because we can see that the flow does definitely race around, but there is some flow separation and some wake before the canister juts out. This plane is cutting through the wheels, and the reason why this is so important is because these wheels are exposed, and exposed wheels often make up over 40% of a car's entire drag. So if you can really streamline them, then you can dramatically reduce the drag. The students have done a good job at the front, they've added this ramp to help guide the flow over the wheel, we then get very high velocity flow over the top of the wheel. Now, that might seem like a bad thing because of the inherent lower pressure and generally more drag because you are manipulating the flow more. But here, I actually think that's a good thing because it gives the flow more energy to stay attached further over the wheel. The slower the flow was, the further up the flow will separate over the front wheel and that will create a larger wake. The side pod is really well done because the flow stays attached over it nicely. It also does a good job hiding much of the rear wheel, which helps reduce its drag too. Behind the rear wheel, we see that there is some flow jumping out of this wheel well, and that results in the flow over the rear pod to not be so fast. That lower energy creates more of a wake in the back. Now this plane is a horizontal plane cutting through the top of the wheels. Straight away, we can see that the rear half of the car is very good. The main troublesome area is the front wheels, because we get so much wake from them, and then that flows downstream and hits the rest of the car. This bit alone will increase the drag a lot. We see the vortices from the car in this video, and there are a lot. The ramps to the front wheels have vortices rolling up, and that is due to a pressure difference between the top and bottom. Expectedly, the front wheels have a plethora. And one really bad area is the halo, which is a requirement because of safety. But just look at how big the vortices are from such a small object. The drag orbit shows the underbody is really nice. There isn't much produced there. It's really just the front wheels, the halo, and a little bit of the rear wheels which by the way, they've done a really nice job shooting them and keeping them dragged down. Then the rear pods have a decent amount of drag too. That's the first car. Let's compare that to the second car now. Looking at the plane slicing through the center of the car, despite the car's geometry being quite different, the flow is still very similar. That is partly because the geometry that this plane is slicing through is almost the same still. Perhaps one minor difference is that the rear, where the CO2 canister is, has a slightly larger wake now perhaps. When we look at the plane slicing through the wheels, we see many differences now. And honestly, most of these differences result in the second car being worse than the first car. I'm not trying to discourage anyone here because even this car is very well designed, but the first car is just really nice and hard to beat. And any high schooler and even university student should be proud of both designs. So the front ramp is good in that there isn't much deceleration of the flow over it, while the first car experienced that. But because the ramp falls very short of the front wheel, and also it is hollowed out underneath, a larger wake does form behind it. Now that isn't too bad because you do have the wheel right behind it, so all that's really happening is the front wheel is in a wake. But we can see that also over the wheel, the flow detaches further upstream than for the first car. That is partly because of the slightly slow flow over the top and the resulting effect that we discussed earlier, where the flow simply doesn't have enough energy to continue further downstream, unlike the first car. After the front wheel, we see some major problems. So for the first car, the side pod was very big and blocky, which is good in the sense that it really took up much of that room behind the front wheel. For the second car, we have a much sleeker side pod, which is good in that at the rear, it kicks the flow up over the rear wheel nicely, but because there is no geometry taking up that wake behind the front wheel, we get a larger wake. And I'm still really impressed with how sleek this side pod funnels some of the flow underneath though. That is really nicely done. And the rear of the car is worse because it terminates bluntly. The rear area is just a lot bigger and honestly, when it comes to cars and really anything you want to make low drag, a good rule of thumb to follow is to make the rear area as small as possible. That is partly because it reduces the tendency for the flow to separate, but also it means that in the event that it does still separate, you have a smaller area exposed to the low pressure that helps reduce the drag. It's kind of akin to a sleek sedan like for example the Mercedes CLA compared to a four wheel drive. One has a small rear area, the other one has a large rear area, and the one with the larger rear area has a much higher drag coefficient and drag overall. From this top view, it's very obvious that the second car has a much larger wake at the rear, and even around the rear half of the car. That is partly because of the wakes from the front wheels, and that occurs partly because the wakes from the wheels are pushed out more than from the first design. Now, I would like to look at the vortices orbit. 
but honestly, there is so much going on that it's about as clear as mud. So I'll just let it play here and you can look at it, but let's just move on to the drag orbits where things are clearer. I think from this view, the front wheel drag is very similar. However, at the rear, near the top, the second car seems to have more drag. That is because of that earlier separation over the wheels. And you can see now how much more drag extends down under the side pods of the second car because of the front wheels. Apart from that, the wakes of the rear are very similar with only slightly more behind the rear pods of the second car, which is because they are more bluntly terminated. In terms of the drag, the first car produced about 0.66 newtons, which is about 66 grams pushing backwards, while the second car produced 0.71 newtons, so about 71 grams. So the first car has less drag. For the lift, well, these values fluctuated quite a lot, and that is partly because of the unsteadiness of the wake, but also because of the CO2 mixing with the wake too and that exacerbated that unsteadiness. For the first car, the lift was between 11 grams and 49 grams. For the second car, the lift was between 23 grams and 50.5 grams. So for both the lift and drag, the first car is better. Let's now go forward with this first car and compare it to the third car. For this third car, the front ramps are again those hollowed out ones, but now the front of the car is higher and there is a splitter directing the flow to each side of the car. From this plane, both cars have very similar effects on the flow in that, for most of the car, it stays attached and very well behaved. Again, only the halo and the driver is really creating any wake, then at the rear, we get wakes too. For this third car though, the round of the rear edge of the canister holder a little, but more importantly, the canister sticks out more. What that does is provide a fairly gradual reduction in the geometry, and uses the canister to make it a smaller wake. Now, we do get some wake just behind the underneath of the canister, but because the exposed surface is either completely horizontal or at an angle, most of those negative effects are not passed onto the drag, but rather kept in the lift direction. So from this plane, this third car is doing really well. Let's now move to the plane cutting through the wheels. Now again, this front ramp design is not great. We can see a larger wake behind it, which isn't as bad as it could be, but the first car's ramp are much better. Also. This hollowed out ramp again results in the flow detaching a little bit more upstream and the wake is much larger. Now, the side pods of this third car are much better and rival the first car's ones. Then the rear wheel is nicely covered again by how much the side pods extend down. But the rear pod is again terminating too bluntly, whereas the first car has better rear pods. The wakes are smaller. From this top view, we now see something really good about this third car and that is just how wide the body is just behind the wheels. By doing that, you really take up much of that room there and reduce the wake size. That is good for drag reduction. For the rear of the car, I really like how much it tapers in to reduce that area there. You can see just how much smaller the wake is now. The drag behind the front wheels seems a little smaller for this third design. It definitely doesn't extend as far downstream, which is because of how much the body fans out. It's also important to note that it fans out in a gentle way and not suddenly. That helps reduce the drag too. The wake at the rear, particularly from the rear pods, is way smaller, and that is because it tapers in more. And because I cleverly used the canister as part of the tapering to form the central cylinder, they are able to reduce the drag there too. So remember that the first car had a drag of 0.66 newtons, while well, this third car had a drag of 0.59 newtons, so more than 10% lower. For the lift, the car isn't as good because the first car had a lift between 11 grams and 49 grams, while this third car had a lift between 37 grams and 69 grams. So from that, I would be strongly inclined to go for the third design, even though it produces more lift, and that is because each design produces a moment rotating it into the ground. But let's now go further and give some suggestions on how to make these cars lower drag, and also potentially lower lift, because anytime you produce anything, you are working the flow. That almost always means more drag. So in a roundabout way, you can reduce the drag by reducing the lift here too. And again, if you have any suggestions for these students, then put them in the comments below. Let's focus on the third car because it is already really good. I would change its front ramps to the first car's front ramps. That would also help reduce the front wheel's drag a little too. I would then keep the rear side pods the same, but you can see how the front car's rear pods slope upwards. I would do the same thing for the third car's rear pods too. Now, that is all we can really suggest without consulting the rules. One thing I want to clarify is the rear wing. So in the rules, they're in German and my German is rusty, so I may be missing something here, but I can't find anywhere whether a rear wing is or isn't required. If it is required, then 
I would take advantage of that to connect the rear wing to the car with one vertical fin. I would also make that fin and thick airfoil like a NACA 0021 profile. The reason why I would do that is because you want to align the direction of the car with the string. If you do that, then all the CO2's force will be used to push you in the right direction. Simply using the same theory as rockets where fins are there to stabilize the direction, a fin at the rear and made as the rear wing support system will do that and the force it will create through misalignment with the string will create a restorative moment and make the car go straighter. Now, if you don't need a rear wing, then I probably wouldn't put a fin on because the additional weight would possibly override the benefit you'll get out of it. If you can test it with and without a rear fin, you could then determine whether that is the case or not. You could then tell if that extra weight was worth it or not. For the Halo, we saw that it and its supports add a lot of weight and drag. The rules say that until you get to the national championships, you don't actually need one, so I would remove it. And if you want to keep it, then there isn't much you can do to change it. Its design is pretty much fixed because in rule 3J, you can't put anything inside the red box encompassing it and that's just dumb. Anyway, in 3A of the rules, we have a really important point. The car has to be between 190 millimeters and 240 millimeters long. When I did this CO2 racer thing at my school, we also had a similar rule. At the time though, 3D printers didn't exist. So we made ours out of balsa wood. So I decided to make my car as light as possible. And to do that, I made it shorter. That reduced length overrode the advantage that I got from being light. And I didn't win overall. I came like fourth or fifth or something. So what I would do here is make the car as long as possible. And then on a 3D printer, make the car hollowed out. So you still have the lowest weight allowed. That way you get the additional length and the lowest weight possible, the best of both worlds. As a side note, there's a part in the rules 3C which translates into there must be an area on your side pod to hold the sticker. An absolutely unrestricted view of the sticker from the side must be guaranteed. The sticker must be applied there. They're really keen on the sticker. It makes me wonder what's on the sticker. I want to see the sticker. Anyway, moving on. In 3G, there is this picture of a virtual volume, which is a volume that has to exist somewhere on the car. It effectively fixes the smallest height the car can be. But one thing I haven't found is the minimum width that the car can be. In 3B, it says the maximum width is 85 millimeters, but I can't seem to find anything about the minimum. If so, then I would recommend making this bad boy as slim as possible to reduce the frontal area that will reduce the overall drag. Now, we saw that in all three designs that directly behind the front wheels, there was free space and a wake. Well, while covering this volume up would be good, rule 3H says you can't do that, so let's move on. In section four, we see the dimensions of the wheels and the students have cleverly made their wheels as small as possible. That's because wheels are drag producers and making them as small as you can reduces the drag. In 4F, it says that you effectively have to have the side wheels completely exposed from the side and top views. So you can't cover them to reduce the drag. So there's nothing really you can do about that. One smart thing they've done though is make the rim solid instead of having spokes. That also reduces the drag, so that's good. And that kind of brings us to the end of this video. I don't have any more suggestions because anything else I wanted to say isn't allowed. But if you have any suggestions, drop them in the comments below. And good luck to the students and peace out amigos.